this something you learned? Were you born an entrepreneur? You got to start small. I have not allowed being a woman to hold me back. Credibility is not just making money, it's about making sure that you know people trust what you're doing. Law practice is not only about going to court, it's about advice. It's very difficult to, to hire somebody who's not motivated and then make them motivated. But one of the things that I'm known for is integrity. They have to see you as a person of integrity. It was right. <laughs> Welcome to the Executive Lounge. I'm Inshira Adam. Hello and welcome to the Executive Lounge with me and Shira Addo. And uh, this is our sixth season. This is the show that brings you the insights from the lives and uh, work of men and women who scale the daunting heights of either starting their own business or uh, managing institutions right here at home and around the world. My guest today is a son of the land, but currently uh, a very big household name when it comes to planning and architecture in the United States of America. Mr. Kofi Bonner is an architect, a planner, and a man who just loves to transform spaces and lives through architecture. You're welcome to the Executive Lounge. Thank you, I'm happy to be here. It's good to catch you. Um, yeah. A few weeks ago, uh, I was in uh, San Francisco and uh, I had the uh, honor of uh, connecting with you and I'm happy that you made the trip here and we could sit down. Yeah, amazing. Just a few scant weeks ago, we were in San Francisco, and here we are in Homeland Ghana. It's, That's all, right. it's wonderful. Yeah. So let's start off um, with, of course, you're Ghanaian, um, mm -hmm. and um, you've been in the States for quite a long time. Mm -hmm. um, was that always the plan? Were you an architect before you left? Uh, well, I had finished my four years in uh, tech, Okay. Uh, and I taught for a year. And then I took an opportunity to do my graduate studies at uh, UC Berkeley. And as with many Ghanaians who leave here, you know, you go to uh, another country, you say, oh, I'll be gone about five years and I'll come back. Well, it's been a while. I didn't come <laughs> back. So, no, I, it wasn't the plan, yeah. but it certainly uh, has proven fruitful. Mm. Okay, we'll get to know more about you, but I'm very curious to learn more about your work. Sure. Um, I, I, I was amazed. Uh, while I was in San Francisco, I was attending Oracle's Open World uh, uh, event, and uh, there was a, an exhibition about smart cities. Mm -hmm. And then I learned that um, Emeryville in San Francisco um, happens to be a smart city, and you had a hand in creating that. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, how did the Emeryville, the inspiration for the Emeryville redevelopment uh, come about? You know, to be honest, Emeryville is smart because it's evolved into smartness. <laughs> I would like to say we knew back in the late 80s what, exactly what we were doing in terms of uh, the technology of the cities, but we didn't. We were very focused on transforming what was uh, a, a, essentially an old deindustrialized city. In, in other words, Emeryville's primary economy had been around industry. Right. And those industries died and left. And so Emeryville's economy was really shaky. And we were very focused as uh, city planners, as uh, uh, the city developers, if you will, in trying to transform its economy to take advantage of the new economy. Mm -hmm. And the new economy at that time was, lo and behold, focused around biotechnology, life sciences, and the early days of tech. Mm -hmm. And that's what we created, a plan that would attract those kinds of businesses to populate what were once old warehouses that were, uh, you know, frankly, old industries. Wow, interesting stuff. Um, so it was more a re retrofitting of, of, of the space to be usable for the incoming a new tech space. Um, but as you said, at that time you would now look back and say, well, you didn't know that it would be what it is today. What was, what was the inspiration for you? What was the vision that you had for Emeryville at the time? Well, there are many things we were very intentional on. We made it a point of trying to understand what those businesses that we were trying to attract, what did they need? Physically, what did they need? More importantly, what did the, uh, uh, the potential employees need? And we recognized that we had a template of fairly large, vacant mm -hmm. uh, uh, industrial spaces, 
and we could put uh, infrastructure in place that could really accommodate those uh, types of businesses and we increased the housing supply and it was somewhat affordable uh, compared to the adjacent cities at the time compared to, compared to Berkeley and to uh, certainly compared to San Francisco and to Oakland. So we were able to create an affordable mix of homes adjacent to places of employment mm -hmm. and fairly large urban tracts, which is very hard to find in a very dense area. Mm -hmm. I mean, some of these um, urban parcels were seven, five, six, seven, eight acres wow. adjacent to each other. So uh, we could really plan for that scale of business. And that became very attractive to businesses that felt that they could come in mm -hmm. somewhat small and yet ramp up as they grew. Mm -hmm. And many of them, frankly, went public. So they did need to have that scale or scalability, as we say. So there were, and, and then it was a question of bringing in the kinds of amenities that their employees uh, were looking forward. I mean, it's very clear that uh, employees of tech companies and bioscience tech uh, companies are looking for an urban environment where they can find food fairly easily, because food is a form of entertainment, mm -hmm. as you know, where they could have easy access to open space and frankly that where they could also uh, go to the movies and bars etc and so we were able to recreate and redefine that city as a place to live work and play okay. and by doing so uh, we became quite um, attractive to uh, these businesses and some of them that were there already decided to stay there and make Emeryville their headquarters, places like Chiron. And others that were perhaps struggling in other areas actually made a conscious decision to move from other areas to come to Emeryville. Okay. So in a, within a fairly uh, short space of time, at least for a city, mm -hmm. uh, 15 years of really short space of time, it really tripled its population and wow. uh, really changed its, its business base. And as you saw by living in uh, one of the hotels there and adjacent, the, the adjacency from the hotel to the entertainment district was two was blocks a, within walking distance. Yeah, it was about three, four minute walk. And that was intentional. Right. So let's borrow some learnings from the Emeryville project mm -hmm. and juxtapose that over Ghana's own, um, and let's say Accra, mm -hmm. maybe Kumasi and Takradi. These are um, developing urban uh, spaces. Mm -hmm. um, there's a phenomenon that uh, we may have a case of development preceding planning. Um, and I, I, I say so advisedly because we do have plans. So maybe mm -hmm. its enforcement and the sticking to the intent may not have been as rigid as mm -hmm. should be. Um, would you see a city like Accra being able to reinvent itself um, to the point where you are attracting industry, you're attracting new business, you're attracting the right kind of people, you're having a right mix of uh, housing that accommodates both the people at the broader side of the pyramid and those at the top and in the middle. There is absolutely no doubt that Accra is evolving rapidly, actually. Um, I've been coming home, fortunately, uh, my family, and many of my family members are here, and I've been coming home fairly regularly for the last 10 years or so. And Accra is going through an evolution that is actually quite impressive in some respects. Mm -hmm. There is no doubt, however, that uh, some of it perhaps is development preceding planning. <laughs> uh, and certainly that should be changed. But even before our very eyes, Accra is being seen as a, as a hub of uh, culture, entertainment, nightlife. And you see all the new uh, uh, towers that are being built uh, around us. And, and that is absolutely necessary to continue. It has to continue. Um, all the projections show that the more and more of the population will be living in urbanized areas, which means there should be fewer and fewer and lesser and lesser uh, buildings of certain heights. And we should go denser. But as we go more dense, we have to create those urban, urban open spaces so that people can still breathe mm -hmm. in those spaces. It's okay to go, what we find in America is that there's a tendency not to focus so much now on the space where you sleep, but the space where you spend most of your waking mm -hmm. hours. Mm -hmm. 
And where you spend most of your waking hours, we try in the more public spaces to create those opportunities for people to want to be there. Uh, and as such, there's more of a, com uh, a drive to create an urban community. Uh, and that's where, you know, frankly, technology can help a great deal. But technology only uh, should make things easier for people to uh, just interact with each other mm -hmm. so that they spend less time worrying about other things. Um, but uh, no, I think the short answer to your question is there is no question that Accra is evolving um, and perhaps it needs to evolve a little faster okay. given the pace of urbanization. Uh, the, that's, that's probably the somewhat not so good news, but the, I think the better news is there are plenty of spaces for that urbanization to occur. Yeah. Um, it, it is important, however, um, uh, that the, the, the economics around the urbanization is, uh, is attended to. Um, not, there's a pace for absorption, there's a pace for growth that is critically important. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not a if you build it, it will come or they will come scenario. It really has to be carefully planned in the right places and spaces. And, uh, and we have to be very intentional about how we connect the pieces together. And urban infrastructure in all facets of infrastructure, connect the connective tissue of all these places and spaces must be thought through. You know, you talked about the deliberateness uh, mm -hmm. or the need for being deliberate mm -hmm. about um, the development and its interfacing with the economic activity. Mm -hmm. um, you did serve as, uh, I don't know if you still do, but as uh, an economic advisor mm -hmm. um, for the city of San Francisco. Um, how much of your good intent and planning and great ideas um, is able to navigate or what are the three key things that you think is necessary to navigate the politics of the economics? Well, I, well, the politics of the economics, that's a great term actually, but uh, there is no question that the real estate economics uh, is geared in the likelihood of getting acceptance through the politics. Uh, and uh, so one has to always uh, pay attention to whether or not a particular development can be accepted within a particular community. Um, I, I'll give you an example, though, of where a city came together. The city, let's go back to Emeryville, mm -hmm. and, and then I'll come to San Francisco. The city of Emeryville came together with very intentionally because the, the economics of the city, the tax base, was frankly being focused much more on an industry that were, was not sustainable. Right. And we were able to bring new uh, business in and therefore diversify the tax base and it is now very, very, very strong. Mm -hmm. To the extent that many, many public buildings have been built, childcare centers, senior centers, uh, urban uh, parks, it's really, really special and they've upgraded their infrastructure significantly. But there was one particular uh, parcel that was uh, an old canning factory. It was owned by a company called Del Monte. Del Monte okay, still yeah. exists. Mm -hmm. Del Monte is a huge uh, uh, global uh, company. And they, in, in back in the day, uh, Del Monte had about 14 acres in Emeryville, and it was a canning factory. Of course, as I said, much of Emeryville um, it's old industries left, mm -hmm. and there was this 14 acres of a v w old warehouse with a large parking area. Um, and we intentionally sought businesses that, could, that were looking to have a headquarters there. And it just so happened that the um, Kaiser Healthcare uh, was looking for a new headquarters and had, had a very difficult time trying to stay in their native Oakland, the, oh, wow. the, the city that they essentially began. And because we were just one city over, we were able to start talking with them. And we moved quickly. We moved quickly. The, the, the alliance between the, the bureaucrats, because mm -hmm. at that time I was uh, the, the, the redevelopment director, and the politicians, the city council, was very tight. And we worked on a plan, we came uh, together, we uh, convinced the electorate mm -hmm. that this was a great idea, the electorate approved it. Okay. Unfortunately, the politics of Oakland got stronger and stronger and they were able to um, slow down 
uh, Kaiser to the point where Kaiser felt that it was in their best interest to try to find a solution in Oakland. Wow. However, our efforts had been noticed by other companies that were beginning to think about moving. And today, the site that we had take, we had uh, essentially taken through the whole political entitlement process, as we call it, uh, is now the headquarters for Pixar. I was there. That okay. was originally a site for the headquarters. So that for, would have been Kaiser Permanente's That was Kaiser uh, Permanente's headquarters. Headquarters, okay. And so now it's Pixar. So my point is, you, the key lesson there is, to be intentional about the creation of the infrastructure for certain kinds of businesses and get those approvals because you never know which company may actually end up there, but at least the factors that w were working for one company may well work for a myriad yeah, of other companies. That's right. so, uh, so that's important. Yeah. I think it's important to have a shared vision between the community mm -hmm. and obviously the political entities. And uh, there are a number of things we have learned along the way. Look, sometimes we have been uh, forced to go to the electorate directly because there's often, uh, uh, there's often uh, opposition to large-scale developments, certainly in, in, in uh, America, but most definitely in San Francisco. And uh, we have had to take a, f a couple of times, we've had to go directly to the electorate and ask a very simple question this is the scale of development we would like to bring to this city and to this community. Mm -hmm. If we are able to bring this forward, would you as an electorate support it? And both times we have won. And because we have won, we have been able to give what I consider the backbone to those politicians who may have been a little more cautious mm -hmm. and they have ultimately then supported us throughout the way. And so, um, I think that's always an alignment of vision mm -hmm. uh, is very, very clear. So it's worthwhile spe to spend the time to be crystal clear on the direction, mm -hmm. the arc of development. People have to understand where you're going, especially on the scale of development that we work on. Mm -hmm. And the third is always be mindful of the economics because fundamentally, if the economics don't work, the pretty plans will never get built. Mm -hmm. If there is one thing that Sometimes I find as you go around the world, there are so many plans that end up in beautiful books bound and on shelves. Never and never, they never materialize. And often it's because, well, could be any number of things. One, they didn't pay attention to the alignment of the politics and the electorate. Mm -hmm. Frankly, most of the time it's because the economics of the actual deal were not quite uh, ready, let's say for that particular development. Wow. Uh, and it's important to really think through scale. And uh, the economics of scale is critical. You know, um, the mention of vision and, and a shared vision, who should lead? Should it be the bureaucrats, the politicians, or the people? Who, who, how do you get that sh the framework of a shared vision to work well? Well, often you will find that there, is, um, there are several discussions about what it is a community or a city wants. And so the, it's important to try to understand, cut through a lot of the cloudiness mm -hmm. and the vagaries of the conversation and seek to s those specific development ideas that may actually begin to respond to some of the things you're hearing. And then present it in a fashion, perhaps, uh, maybe it's a newer a refinement of the vision, maybe it's even a, uh, it's taking the vision from where people were talking about it and taking it to another level, but clearly presenting it to, again, the community and the politicians and asking that question, is this the kind of vision have, are we correct in this, uh, in pre pre preparing or presenting this vision? And making it clear that if the answer is yes, then you are the appropriate uh, entity to take it forward. So this is constant dialogue? Constant dialogue. Be and it's important, you say, <laughs> it's a constant dialogue, because sometimes along the way, circumstances change. And uh, often we have found ourselves 
uh, as we say, turning on a dime or pivoting mm -hmm. towards another opportunity. Uh, 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 let me get you back to uh, Mission Bay in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. Mission Bay in San Francisco, up until my uh, uh, shipyard and candlestick project, was probably the largest redevelopment uh, project in, in, in the city. Mm -hmm. And I was the uh, chief economic policy advisor to Mayor Willie Brown right. at the time that that was going through its final stage of entitlements. And I can tell you, at that time, it was very clear, it was essentially... Uh, 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 43 acres of uh, campus for U University of California's mm -hmm. San Francisco campus, which was essentially uh, life sciences and medical mm -hmm. uh, uh, campus. And uh, I think it's about 6,000 units of uh, housing. Wow. Uh, and I believe, I believe about 20% of the homes would be affordable. And then about 6 million square feet of office and, but most of the office and uh, research and development space was geared towards biotech. Okay. Now, now, that was in 1996. No, 1998 was when we got that approved. Today, when you go there, yes, there are about 5,000 homes, and soon there'll be six, the 6,000th one is probably under construction. Mm -hmm. Yes, there's a significant amount of, uh, of uh, UCSF has been built out. In fact, they've added two hospitals to the area, which is incredible. Wow. But along the way, a whole new uh, business model came up. It's called the shared economy. And companies like Uber and Dropbox and uh, Palantir and uh, all these tech companies that have become household names they showed up and their business model has grown and they have required space. And they have taken up a significant amount of the space within Mission Bay, which is very interesting because we didn't plan for that back That's then right. because we wouldn't have known that those businesses would exist. However, the template and the palette was set to accommodate them. And then the icing on the cake for Mission Bay was the Warriors about five years ago, the Golden State Warriors That's determined right. that they needed a new arena. And lo and behold, guess where they built their $1.4 billion arena? Mission Bay. In Mission Bay. No planner can tell you that they anticipated that that would happen. But there was enough room in the plan to allow you to, as you say, turn evolve. on a dime and evolve and meet the new demands. They've had to. And wow. the city has had to, the planners have had to, and the developers have had to. Okay, well, on that note of the agility, we will come back after this break and uh, we'll continue the conversation with uh, Mr. Kofi Bonner. Uh, he's an architect and planner, and uh, he'll be sharing his thoughts on uh, you know, development and planning and how that can spearhead an economic transformation. Stay tuned for more. Welcome back to the Executive Lounge, and uh, this is Inshira Addo, and my guest is uh, Kofi Bonner. And uh, he's an architect and a planner, and uh, we're learning quite a lot about how planning and development goes a long way to impact on economics. Uh, before we went on the break, um, you talked about how sometimes you have to um, either make a U-turn or make a very hard right, <laughs> you know, to, to accommodate evolution that you didn't plan or anticipate. Um, how does that agility work? Because the flexibility doesn't really lie in the fact that you're able to move, but I guess it's within a framework that allows you to still have a work in progress and almost treat it as a, a clear canvas. It is very difficult. It is difficult because on the one hand, um, you have structured your business plan. Mm. At its core, you structured your business plan in a particular direction. Um, and as such, perhaps your financing and, and uh, all your, uh, frankly, government approvals may be in a particular direction. However, there are the easy pivots where new ideas or new businesses can fit right in. Mm -hmm. Uh, whereas, for example, you may have planned for a research and development space for uh, medical or life sciences. Mm. You might find that uh, Google R&D will fit in nicely. It's not that difficult. 
but it could be uh, as radical as expecting to build uh, office buildings and having to put an arena <laughs> there. That's where the, you have to re-engage the, 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 the same entities that you en engaged at the mm. beginning. Because the amenities go. you would need for an arena is totally different from what you would need uh, for office blocks. The infrastructure, the transportation infrastructure, the transit, the way you think about bringing people in and out of that area, very different. Very different indeed. Yeah. Um, so uh, it's not an easy pivot, but it's a pivot that all businesses must make. Because mm -hmm. often you will you sh you're trying to prove to yourself that there is more, it's more economically sustainable to pivot and therefore perhaps your plan actually in the long run mm -hmm. was enriched and enhanced wow. by the pivot as opposed to staying the course. Um, so, so it's a situational, I should say, it's situational. But again, the constant dialogue with the community uh, is critical so that there, there is an element of trust has to be built between the developer, uh, the bureaucrats mm -hmm. in the, within the city, and most importantly, with the community. Okay, so an alignment between city hall, developer, and then the people. Um, but you run, you, you operate in a federal system, so uh, the state of California mm -hmm. um, is independent of, um, you know, the state of Virginia, you mm -hmm. name it. Um, in Ghana, and mm -hmm. across maybe, except Nigeria, we have um, unified republics where they're mm -hmm. not, you know, federal. So there's a top heavy mm -hmm. um, in terms of leading policy. Uh, Ghana is talking about some decentralization mm -hmm. um, uh, of governance. In the absence of a fully uh, devolved governance structure, how do you see this kind of scale of development or even the framework that allows it to happen working in a space like this? Well, the, 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 as you've pointed out, the, the, um, the levers of power mm -hmm. that affect uh, and effect development are uh, different in Ghana. And obviously one has to understand where those levers are. And much of the vision um, um, uh, comes from the, the, the state level mm -hmm. uh, because often the smaller um, municipalities, let's say, do, they just don't have the resources and they don't have the capabilities to move significantly in significantly different directions. It, they must have the help of uh, the government. Um, and that's why, frankly, they're, they're in some respects, when the government has decided to make certain moves, and they've obviously provided the funding and the, and the, um, resource, the resources beyond funding, so the government will to make change mm -hmm change actually can happen sooner than perhaps in, 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 um, in, in America, for example. Okay. Um, because the, 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 the government is willing it to happen. Mm -hmm. uh, and but for funding, mm -hmm. it could happen, it can happen. Now, there are all kinds of issues that y we know well which uh, make um, working here is somewhat unique, and the the the, the, the land ownership structure is that's right uh, unique and complicated, and complicates the ability to really move quickly through the process. But there's a reason for that. I mean, it's a traditional system yeah. that has to be uh, respected, um, and that bec that system is a constituency for that development and therefore one has to pay attention to it the mm -hmm. same way that uh, you, you pay attention to an immediate community in, uh, in San Francisco, you have to pay attention to the community that is the chieftaincy that may actually control the land. Mm -hmm. And that's all part of the conversation. I think it is critical to be clear-eyed about who the, is around the table and where those levers are and must be mm -hmm. uh, in order to make change happen at scale. Yeah.
You know, I uh, took a trip into Silicon Valley. Yeah. Um, and I was, you know, impressed with the evolution and the fact that this originally would have started as large space for technology parks. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and in all the stories you've shared, it, it, there's a clear intent at achieving something in the future. Of course, Ghana's economic development is so that every Ghanaian will be able to afford three square meals mm -hmm. and children go to school and everybody lives mm -hmm. you know, a pretty decent life. Um, and that will not happen overnight. But mm -hmm. there has to be a very constant journey mm -hmm. towards that. The concept of technology parks or um, inducements that drive economic activity into specific areas, um, would I be wrong in imagining that we could use that to address maybe not just one issue of economic development, but also urbanization, which is also something that really has been a problem for us? Perhaps one of the most exciting things about uh, sort of emerging economies and their, and their development capabilities is the fact that they can leapfrog. Um, uh, it is in probably harder to introduce smart infrastructure into San Francisco than it will be to introduce it into Accra. Oh. Be, you know, it, because, because, primarily because of the I mean, look, you've said it well, the America is a capitalist system. The person who owns the land, owns the land and may choose, without, without inducements, they're not going to make changes. Mm -hmm. And their inducements often have to do with bottom line. Nobody, very few people do something for the benefit, of, for the good of the society. The, the landowner that owns a parking space mm -hmm that could be better suited for affordable housing, will not give up that parking, not parking, but parking lot, mm -hmm. will not give up that parking lot just because, unless somebody pays them what they consider to be the fair market. So value. your social good must be tied, you know, to their uh, economic benefit. They, they, because they worked hard to buy that parking mm -hmm. lot. Mm -hmm. And if, the stars have aligned and now it's their time to uh, make what they consider to be a fair market value from that asset, and so be it. Right. And even when the government deems it necessary to take that asset for a social good or a public good, the government is bound by the rules of what's called eminent domain to pay a fair market value. Uh, I've been through that process a few times when I was on the government side and it's actually a fascinating process. Uh, and Emeryville was a classic one. Mm -hmm. Not everybody wanted to sell. Not everybody shared the vision. Wow. Some, there's a couple of guys who owned uh, um, gas stations and uh, we needed to put roads through their gas stations and they didn't want to sell. So we had to go through the public process of eminent domain to gain access and seize their properties. I mean, and ultimately they got paid well. Um, and the city was able to continue. So uh, it is uh, s somewhat easier to do something at scale in the emerging economy mm -hmm. because you're introducing it for the first time in, in, in infrastructure that actually needs to be replaced anyway. Um, um, uh, you know, I, 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 as in our newer developments, we're obviously thinking about smart city infrastructure and we're actually planning for it. And because of the scale of the developments I'm working on, I mean, we're able to grade and pave vast acres. I mean, one of the projects we're working on is 2,000 acres. And so every inch of that will have an opportunity to have something that is associated with the smart, uh, smart infrastructure, be it uh, sensors in the streets or sensors in the lights or smart cameras. Um, public Wi-Fi uh, uh, distributed through uh, the, 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 the street light system. I um, mean, all those things will be introduced as a function of the basic design of that place. Mm. It's much harder to retrofit a city. So, uh, to, in essence, today's underdeveloped city actually has an opportunity to become tomorrow's smart city faster than the so-called established ones. I believe so, because the aging infrastructure in the older 
third world cities mm -hmm. are crying out to be replaced and most governments are actively thinking about replacement and retrofit. Mm -hmm. And they can therefore take the opportunity mm -hmm. to do exactly what we said. Take advantage of technology in the retrofit and replacement. I mean, I see there are some areas in in Accra, for example, that they've replaced all the. I believe they've replaced all the streetlights yeah. and made them all um, more energy efficient. Mm -hmm. Well, it, there is a city in um, close to San Francisco that it was very much harder for them to do that, but they did it. And when they did that, when they replaced the um, uh, streetlights they took advantage of something that was very interesting. They took advantage of the fact that by using more energy efficient lights, mm -hmm. they could reduce their energy bill. By reducing their energy bill, therefore had some money to add enhancements to that light. Wow. So they decided to add smart cameras. So now not only for the same price, they have uh, energy efficient lights mm -hmm. and smart security cameras on those lights. Wow. And the police uh, uh, chief is very, very happy because now they have a very, very uh, a smart security system in certain roads uh, in, 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 in their city. And one has an ability to do those kinds of things here. Um, there are some technologies uh, pub providing public Wi-Fi through low power networks that as we're building out communities, there'd be no reason why we wouldn't add that here. Mm. As we're rebuilding uh, sewer systems, there's no reason not to put t uh, uh, sensors in those so that they're easier to maintain and manage uh, down the road. Um, there's no reason to build parking structures that don't have sensors in them mm. and to create um, applications for the com greater communities so that on their phones, because almost everybody has a phone, mm -hmm. people can find out where best to uh, um, park. Uh, it's interesting. When I come to Accra, I'll tell you something funny, actually. I had a, about... A year and a half ago, you know, I have this guy who drives me around, he's a great guy, and every time I tell him to take me somewhere, he knows exactly where he's going and he tries to get there. So one day I was sitting, I was just stuck in traffic. You can imagine, mm -hmm. it happens a lot in Accra. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I was looking at my phone and I went to my Google uh, map, mm -hmm. and Google, as you know, bought a company called Waze. That's right. Waze is a a, a sort of a wayfinding right. app, and it tells you the, the intensity of traffic along the way. So it will plot out your trip and will essentially tell you whether there's a lot of traffic or not too much traffic on that particular in that trip and give you options. So I just plotted in where I was going, and lo and behold, Waze was giving me a different direction than my driver. Okay. So I kept telling my driver, you need to turn right. And he said, oh, Masa, yeah. it's okay. I know where I'm I going. I know where I'm going. I know where I'm going. I said, no, turn right. Trust me on this one. So what I did was I turned the volume up because, you know, a little voice That's will right. tell you, please turn right. Yeah. And I could see the poor guy was very, very unhappy, but this little machine was telling him to turn right, left, go. Then lo and behold, we got there, avoided the traffic. And I said, this technology has just helped me through this. All because of how many people have phones in Accra. That's right. So every phone that's sending a, sis a signal up to the cell to the to all to and then that coming down through algorithms and plotting my uh, uh, the direction where I'm going, and, and that simple thing just made my life easier, as it can make everybody's life easier. You know, it's a very um it's already here. Uh, it's here, you know. I, I just never really thought about the concept of Internet of Things as, as being brought to the level of wayfinding, as you just explained it. So we have had Internet of Things for quite a while. Yes. Uh, Every, so just, many things are connected. Several level, <laughs> yeah, several levels of application. Mm -hmm. And in the smart city model you're describing, um, you know, the, the benefits for fighting crime, the benefits for ensuring that, like you said, sewers... Um, are better controlled. We have perennial flooding in Accra, for mm -hmm. example. Uh, we have sanitation problems. Mm -hmm. um, in, the, in, the, in the Oracle um, Smart City uh, mm -hmm. installation at Open World, um, you know, 
it was describing how sense says, you know, even everything too smart, uh, trash. You know, um, what are the applications from your, you know, coming in and out of uh, the country for a while, do you feel that we could be using to leapfrog and improve livelihoods and, and the way we work? Well, uh, well I think, uh, you know, it's interesting. I said before that the, the technology in and of itself may not be um, the be all end all of things. Mm -hmm. To me, the, fu the fact is te so technology can make your life easier and give you time, okay. more time to interact mm. with other people. That's where I think technology could be really useful. So you don't waste time in traffic because it's redirecting cars mm -hmm. and buses and telling people where to go. Imagine if, every, if all the uh, trotros, mm -hmm. if all the trotros suddenly were, had something in them that told people exactly where they were and they knew where their passengers were going to be, so they didn't all have to just sit and wait in one spot, maybe there would be a little better flow. Hmm. It's simple things that technology can do. And so the, the people who have to get up at 4 a.m. and wait for two hours before, you know, maybe they don't have to do that because... Um, you can actually book your trotter in you advance and you know you have a And your trotter driver there. knows exactly how much they're going to make per trip because it's already booked. Wow. That exists already. So rideshare app. Mm -hmm. It's a ride share app. We have, uh, in one of our uh, developments in San Francisco, we have a shuttle service. And that shuttle service, and we worked with Bosch on this, that we have a shuttle service and we have a, what we call a community app. And on everybody who buys a home in the community, there's a, an app. And it, once they join that app, that app actually will tell you exactly where that shuttle is. So that when you're ready to get on that shuttle, you don't have to go wait at the stop. You'll, you can you'll time just it time the, it so that you can do whatever you're doing, finish it, and then go. Uh, and more importantly, that driver has a feel for how many people are going to be ready on it. Uh, we have, we're introducing a ride share app so, so that says that if I, I live in San Francisco, but I work in Silicon Valley, and I need to get there at 10 o'clock, I'm happy to drive, but I don't... I've got a car with three, four more passengers can sit in. So I'll just put it in the community app and anybody else who wants to or needs to go to Silicon Valley within 15 minutes of me, mm -hmm. say, sign up, I'll come with you. I've just taken three, four cars off the road. So lower carbon footprint. You got it. Mm. Those very simple applications. I mean, there are, very, there are some much more complicated and like the trash mm -hmm. one is a fascinating one. We have toyed with that uh, in some of our um, developments where we use, uh, in fact, they use it in uh, Northern Europe, in Stockholm, for example, had 50 years where you can uh, you vacuum trash. The, 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 the trash oh, like the shoots, shoots, the shoots the trash that the old banking systems used to use. Exactly. Okay. You, you separate your trash and you put it in the, a chute and it shoot. takes it to a central location. Wow. And because of that, you don't have dump trucks running Moving around all over the, the place. So when a third world country or, 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 or a city in an emerging economy is being reimagined, uh, it can reimagine those kinds of things mm -hmm. so that the trash is a little easier to pick up. Wow. I mean, uh, because at the end of the day, when you are building the infrastructure for roads and you're building the trenches for the pipes, etc., you're just building three more pipes in the trench. That's right, because you're separating, you're, you're separating um, compost, and yeah. paper. And it's already separated. And, it went, and then, then you can direct your trucks to go there and then people are monitoring it. Um, it, it's, uh, it, it, it's, it's happening now. And we it's have an opportunity now. to leapfrog. And we have an opportunity to leapfrog. Fantastic. We're going to take our final break. And uh, when we come back, uh, we're going to learn a little more about some of the other things that uh, Kofi has been uh, involved in. This is the Executive Lounge, and there's more where this came from. Stay tuned. Welcome back to the Executive Lounge with me in Chirado and my guest, Mr. Kofi Bonner, is a planner and an architect and uh, we've been talking smart cities and uh, mm -hmm. 
I'm super excited. You know, I think that um, rightly so that the Chinese don't have a word for opportunity because accident and opportunity <laughs> mean exactly the same. So we may look at our country whenever we're traveling and say, oh, we're underdeveloped. Uh, and these, but the potential to um, leapfrog and become the new best place to be is upon us because of where we find ourselves. And, and I like that. Um, the thing I learned about how smart cities work is that it has to be oodles of bandwidth to mm -hmm. push data and, and so algorithms can run off the back of the data network and all of that, which simply means the internet. Um, 5G is a big deal now um, because apparently that's how we're going to power smart cities. Internet penetration in Ghana is increasing, but the cost is not going down. Mm -hmm. um, how much of the cost barrier could limit our speed to leapfrogging and, and deploying smart cities? Well, I think um, the, it's interesting that the costs, the, I think the costs haven't come down because by the time some of these new, like 5G is being talked about in mm -hmm. Ghana, 4G just got here, but we're going to 5G, and it's almost there's not enough time for things to settle and scale to build up. Right. And um, um, the first world countries, they build, they build up a little more slowly, so those established companies have business models that know exactly how many customers are they going to move off 4G into 5G mm. so they can begin to think about the, the, you know, the marginal cost of the next big thing. Okay. Whereas here, there's probably a lot more um, subsidy required to move people from 2G to 5G. Right. And then probably, uh, I think, that I'm not quite clear of the um, the connection or association between government and its IT policies and those comp private companies that literally provide uh, uh, fiber and, uh, and, and the communication networks. Mm -hmm. um, um, in, in America, it's all very capitalistic. So f f people, uh, those companies are spending billions of dollars in laying fiber mm -hmm. and then spending hundreds of millions of dollars on, on marketing to sell to the people, people okay. to get them onto theirs. It's interesting because if you think about it, they're, 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 the communication companies are getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And now the reason people are going for, are interested in higher speeds and more bandwidth is because of the content. Mm -hmm. Now people want to watch their NFL game mm -hmm. on their phone. You need some proper yeah, bandwidth, bandwidth to, be able to do to that because yes. you're moving around, so you, your connectivity must be pretty good. Mm -hmm. And that's why I will pay maybe five dollars a month more for that content. Mm. But some of the five dollars I've just spent is probably subsidizing the infrastructure cost right. that a company used to put it in the ground. And there's competition mm -hmm. between those companies, so I have a choice: do I do it on five dollars or six ninety nine here? Or, so what content do I get on this system versus that system? Or maybe I'm a hog and I want both of them, so I'll pay $11. Mm -hmm. My point is, content is always being king. It's not the technology or the bandwidth, it's what am I going to do with it? Until or unless uh, Ghanaians see an absolute benefit to having bigger bandwidth, probably won't be uh, as uh, cost effective for the individual. But if, but if there's something I really need mm -hmm. and I have to therefore pay for, I'll be willing to pay for it. Wow. The, and the more customers, the cost begins to come down. Okay. So talking about NFL, you're involved with uh, is it the Cleveland, uh, Cleveland Browns. Browns. Uh, what's the story there? Uh, it's a fascinating story. So you recall that I was the chief economic policy advisor to Mayor Willie Brown. That's right. So one of the, other than dealing with pure redevelopment and economic development, business and attraction for the city and county of San Francisco, one of the things that he, cha he charged me to do was retaining the San Francisco 49ers in San Francisco. Wow. Because San Francisco 49ers needed and wanted a new stadium. I failed miserably in that because they obviously moved to Santa Clara. They're That's no right. longer in the city of San mm -hmm. Francisco. But the interesting uh, thing is 
I became very, very close to the 49ers brass. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and in, the time, in that time frame, in the late 90s, the president and chief executive officer of the 49ers became the president and chief executive officer of the new Cleveland Browns. Right. Because the old Cleveland Browns had moved to Baltimore and became the Baltimore Ravens. Anyway, <laughs> as it turns out, the new Browns didn't have a team. They didn't have a stadium. They just had a president and CEO and an owner. So one of the first things, it's like a startup, mm -hmm. a startup NFL business. That's what we were. And one of the first things that we needed was to build a stadium as we were building the manpower for the team. And the president and CEO of the 49ers um, asked me to join him to be his chief administrative officer uh, of the Cleveland Browns. And that's when I went to Cleveland with the family and I built the Cleveland Brown Stadium. Um, the city had built about 40% of it, and I, but I was, the own, I was the owner's rep to take it all the way. Uh, and then I was essentially running all their business operations. And it was fascinating. It was literally an NFL startup team. Wow. It's actually 20 years, yeah, 20 years ago. When you started that venture? When we started the new Cleveland Browns. This is their 20th year. And how's, how's it coming along? Well, the 20th year looks better than the first 19. <laughs> <laughs> so at least you're heading somewhere in the right direction. You're heading somewhere in the right direction, okay, I would say that. But, but that was a lot of fun. The NFL well, was a lot of fun. Well, unfortunately, I only have uh, under an hour to, oh. to, to plunder your fine brain. <laughs> but uh, it's been a wonderful conversation. Yeah. Um, I look forward to catching you for a rebound uh, next time you're in town. All uh, right. I think that uh, there's a lot more we can learn from you. Uh, but as always, at the end of the show, I share five things I'm taking away from this conversation. Number one for me is uh, humility. Um, I, I think that uh, humility is a virtue that is worth exploring. Uh, Kofi clearly has achieved a lot. I'm sure he has even uh, bigger ambitions, but he clearly have, has navigated a number of complex roads uh, in his life and journey and um, is still on his way. And, but he carries himself uh, very well as someone who's approachable and you can tell uh, in his you know, uh, storytelling and everything that at the core of it all is humanity shines through. And so it's important that we remain human, feet on the ground, uh, because no one is an island. Uh, number two is that uh, failure doesn't always spell the end. Um, fascinating story about uh, the Cleveland uh, Browns, uh, how it all started, uh, not being able to keep the 49ers in San Francisco. But then, as um, fate will have it, he still ended up having a football team in San Francisco that has a stadium. So you may not win the battle the way you anticipated, but in the end, you will get to where you wanted to get to. And number three is that uh, underdevelopment or disadvantage actually is an advantage. So what you don't have is actually room to have what you dream of. And number four for me is um, passion. You know, um, there's a clear passion in a lot of what he's done. Very ambitious dreams, um, very complex, um, you know, structures and uh, bringing different stakeholders together. It takes passion to wake up every day wanting to do better than you did the day before. And for me, the final thing is that um, there's always that part of you that will always bring you back home. Uh, never forget where you are, who you are, where you came from, because they all in intricately come together to build a better world. Kofi, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very and, much. Um, just before we go, uh, what do you do to relax? Oh, I, I love to read. I love music. I am one of those that keeps up with the Ghanaian music scene, probably more so than my kids. Okay. Uh, uh, but I, I love to read, and I still watch sports. Good. And, uh, you know, Ghana, man, I still love to dance. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful stuff. Well, thank you so much. It's been great talking to you. Yeah. And it's Likewise. been great having you watching us, as always. And uh, I'm thankful that we can come your way with the Executive Lounge uh, every time you tune in on a weekend. We'll be back with more next week. I'm in Shirado, as always. Go forward, make rain. Shalom. Is this something you learned when you're born an entrepreneur? You've got to start small. 
I have not allowed being a woman to hold me back. Credibility is not just making money, it's about making sure that you know people trust what you're doing. Law practice is not only about going to court, it's about advice. It's very difficult to, to hire somebody who's not motivated and then make them motivated. One of the things that I'm known for is integrity. They have to see you as a person of integrity. Right. <laughs> Welcome to the Executive Lounge. I'm Inshira Adam.